All right, so welcome and good afternoon. Um, thanks for joining us. My name is Eric Haugi. I'm the Executive Director here at Homeline, and you're joining us on Wednesday, March 23rd at 1.30 for another one of our tenant landlord seminars uh, and webinars on um, rental housing topics, um, particularly during the, the pandemic, but other topics as well. Um, today, we are joined by um, attorneys Mike Vra and Rachel Sterling here at Homeline, our managing attorney, uh, as well as Rachel Sterling, our COVID-19 eviction response coordinator and housing attorney. And, um, and we're also joined by special guest speaker, uh, referee Tiffany Cedillos, um, who is a housing court referee in the fourth judicial um, district uh, in housing court here in Hennepin County. Um, and we'll be going through a number of items here um, before we get started, just a couple logistical items. Um, just a reminder about uh, Homeline. We're a statewide nonprofit organization. We've advised around uh, approximately 280,000 renter households since opening 30 years ago. Um, our tenant free and confidential tenant hotline is available in um, English, Spanish, Somali, and Hmong languages. And uh, we have a variety of uh, housing attorneys, tenant advocates, organizers, uh, volunteers, and interns that help uh, advise renters throughout the state. Um, you can contact our tenant hotline. We do provide general legal information um, and uh, advice on these webinars and we have a library of rec previously recorded webinars. Um, but if you are a renter and you have a specific question about your situation, it's really best if you give us a call directly on the tenant hotline or contact us via our email and attorney system so we can advise you about your situation. Um, we do have a number of uh, eviction moratorium phase out resources as we share every every month, um, a number of pages on our website that give an overview. Uh, Rachel in our office is going to do a very brief overview in just a moment here, um, but you can access th those resources on our website. Um, just a reminder that today, uh, after Rachel goes through a brief overview of the current situation with the eviction moratorium phase out and, and uh, related emergency rental assistance uh, issues, um, we will have referee Cedillo's uh, talk. And um, we really strongly encourage um, questions from the audience. We did get some in advance uh, about the topic, uh, the topics that the referee will be covering, um, specifically, uh, you know, what's going on in Hennepin County Housing Court, as well as um, on specifically the some of these new uh, rental uh, tenant landlord ordinances in a few several uh, several uh, Hennepin County Hennepin County cities that impact the way that uh, the timeline and the the way that evictions can be filed in those cities. Um, but if you have any other questions uh, for the referee or just general tenant landlord questions, um, we'll prior to prioritize those for the referee first and then. Um, both Mike and Rachel will field some other tenant landlord questions uh, as we get towards the end of the session. We have until three o'clock today. So if you do have questions, we uh, encourage you to submit them via the Zoom question and answer function um, as they're easier to keep track of that way. Uh, so again, um, thank you for joining us. And I'm gonna hand it over to housing attorney, uh, Rachel Sterling with Homeline to provide more of an overview of the phase out. Thank you very much, Eric. Um, as Eric said, I am Homeland's COVID-19 eviction response coordinator, which is a big old mouthful. Um, if you've been with uh, or seen some of these before, you will see most of this is very similar to what we've discussed in the past. There hasn't been a lot of change since last month's presentation. So um, I'll go through this fairly quickly. One of the biggest things to note is that Rent Help MN uh, is no longer accepting new applicants. Um, I, they stopped accepting new applicants at the end of January of this year. Um, and this is a big deal because this was the statewide program that was tied to the um, phase out protections that the legislature passed last spring. Um, and so, and I also wanted to mention that I know that there's been some news about Rent Help MN um, just recently got um, some money uh, from the federal government uh, reallocation of funds. Uh, I think they got that as of Tuesday, or maybe Monday of this week that 
is not going to reopen the program. I want to, you know, want to make it very clear that at this point, from what we're hearing, they are not planning on reopening up applications. Um, so just because they got more money doesn't mean that they haven't, frankly, already spent it on applications that are currently pending in their system. Um, so Rent Help MN is no longer accepting applications. And so um, the pending um, pending application protections are limited uh, to those folks who have either already had a pending application who got one in before the January 28th deadline or might be part of one of these other very um, specific geographical programs. So there are, to my knowledge, when I was going through everything as of yesterday, when I uh, was check, checking all of my references, um, if we go to the next slide, the Ramsey County Rental Assistance has some uh, COVID-19 uh, emergency rental assistance still available um, through their program. And so if you are a Ramsey County resident, you can still apply for one of, for this. Um, of course, you have all the same requirements for whether you're eligible or not, but this program, if you have a pending application with this program, will give you protection as well as the next slides, uh, Washington County. If you're a Washington County resident, you can also get protections um, if you have an applica pending application with that um, system. So Ramsey County and Washington County are the two counties that as of yesterday that we're aware of that uh, would qualify for the protections from the phase out laws and um, you're going to ask, what on earth is she talking about? What are these protections? If you haven't been here before, if this is the first you've heard about it, let me go over them briefly with the phase out overview. Um, so there are, uh, last spring, the legislature uh, put into a general temporary session law a protections uh, called the eviction moratorium phase out that basically allows tenants um, some protections against evictions while they have pending applications with a COVID-19 eviction, or excuse me, COVID-19 emergency rental assistance program. Those programs are specifically ones that are funded through the federal government allocations of funds. Um, so that's why I was being beforehand very specific about what programs would qualify or not, because not all rental assistance is funded through one of those federal programs. And so if it's not funded through that federal program, then it doesn't qualify for these protections. And so it gets confusing, right? So I wanna make it very clear what does and what doesn't qualify. So what the phase out was doing was um, as the eviction moratorium that was in place through most of 2020 and uh, first half of 2021, essentially put a stop to most evictions um, with some few exceptions. And so what the phase that was doing was phasing out some of those limitations on landlords and um, putting, uh, allowing some of those reasons, more and more reasons to come back until we were quote unquote back to normal. Um, there's one lingering protection still here um, in effect. This is the protection for tenants who have a pending application with one of those uh, emergency rental assistance programs um, that while the tenant has a pending application with them, with, then they are protected from a non-payment of rent eviction. So if um, pending application means that uh, you hit the submit button and you are in a pending status, the initial reviews, the, the, something like that. Basically, once you've hit submit, you should be in a pending status. If you've been um, approved, um, you're still in a pending status until essentially that payment has been sent. Um, and then once that payment has been collected, you are no longer in a pending status, obviously, because the application has been processed and it's done with. A uh, denial is also, um, once you if you have been denied and you appeal that denial, an appeal is also a pending application status. And so um, that would also qualify for the protections while that appeal is being processed. So again, pending applications mean protection and it protects only for non-payment of rent evictions 
Um, so an eviction is something that has been, uh, it's a, a so formal hearing, it's a proceeding that is um, actually filed with the court. Um, something, so that's what referee Cedillos uh, uh, hears in day in and day out for the most part. I'm sure she will be able to talk much more eloquently about them than I am. Um, but that's what the protection is for, is the court eviction hearing for non-payment of rent. Um, tenants, if they do have one of these uh, more formal eviction hearings, um, our advice just in general across the board is always to show up to the virtual, um, most of them are going to be virtual across the state, uh, over Zoom uh, court for any initial hearing that you've got scheduled, whether you have an app pending application or not. The court is not going to know if you have a pending application um, that would protect you from a non-payment of rent eviction unless you tell them. The court's not psychic as much as we would like them to be. So if you have this protection, you need to let them know. So that's kind of the nutshell of renter protections. Rachel, I was going to jump in and because there is a question that is mm -hmm. related to the previous slides about gotcha. emergency assistance. So Kimberly okay. is asking, is Hennepin and Dakota County not protected anymore? They don't have applications available to, uh, you can't, as a, a tenant, you can't apply directly to a Hennepin or Dakota County um, funding. I So at this point, that's why we're not including them is because you can't, as a tenant, proactively apply for them if you're behind on rent. Yeah, and, and there, again, as Rachel said, there's a very specific definition that protects you from, from, from a, uh, eviction for non-payment. It has to be funding from one of these emergency rental assistance programs that are federal. So there are other pots of funding like emergency assistance through the county. Those don't necessarily fit under this protection, but they still could help you get your rent paid. Mm -hmm. um, but for the, protect, for the protections that you were talking about, it has to be one of these specific programs. No, great question. Okay. And thank you for having me stop so I can take a breath. <laughs> um, all right, we can go on though. Um, this slide I'm going to go through real quick because this is essentially uh, a lot of what uh, referee Sidious is going to be talking about. But part of the eviction moratoriums was that there was this requirement of a pre eviction notice that landlords had to give. Um, that was also part of the initial early parts of the phase out. Um, and so that has expired. There's no longer any statewide pre-eviction notice requirement. There are some federal notice requirements um, that are in place. Uh, there's a lingering one from the CARES Act. There's also one in place uh, for HUD properties. It's very similar to the CARES Act. Both of them require a 30-day pre-eviction notice for non-payment of rent. Um, however, uh, CARES Act properties are slightly different from HUD properties. Uh, in many, uh, and that the HUD properties one also requires the landlord to give information about what the uh, may be available for, um, like emergency assistance for rental, uh, rental assistance, kind of like rent help amen and things like that. Though, um, so that's a requirement for the HUD properties pre eviction notice. And the HUD properties pre eviction notice um, is limited in when it's applicable um, to when there are uh, times of national emergency, such as COVID 19, um, when the uh, HUD program feels that a, such a, a pre eviction notice would be um, useful for tenants' protections, basically. Um, some cities have pre eviction filing notices um, that is. And like I said, literally what Referee Cities will be talking about in just a couple minutes, so I will not touch on those at all. Um, if we go on to the next slide, a lot of people have been asking, what have been happening with evictions? And so that's something that we've been trying to keep a track of. And so this is kind of just a really brief uh, overview of eviction reasons that we've been tracking um, so for, our, for this year, so January through March 21st. Again, when I was pulling the data yesterday, that was the most recent data that we'd had. So um, to explain this chart just briefly, um, that yellow line that's at the very top, way, way, way of all the other ones, is the non-payment of rent eviction filings. Um, again, you can see January is the first dot, February is the second dot, much higher. And then March is the third dot. Um, it's much lower at this point, but again, that's about a week uh, 
it's a week short of the full amount of data. So um, uh, this was something that we'll continue to track. Um, the next line, you know, everything else is kind of the next two that are much lower than non-payment, but kind of intertwined with each other are breach of lease and um, holding over evictions. Um, so those are the next two that kind of alternate between which one is more common or not. Um, and then there's uh, a couple of the other ones down at the bottom that are almost negligible. They don't happen very often. And these are for numbers across the state. These aren't specific to Hennepin County. This is stuff that's across the state. So this is just an interesting snapshot about, you know, we've been talking about eviction protections and things like that. But what are the eviction numbers actually looking like? This is a snapshot. We are hoping to do a and planning on doing a much more in-depth overview of that at some point here in the future. Probably not until this summer, though. Um, so this is um, just, I guess, a teaser, a sample um, of some of the bits that you can uh, anticipate for that. If you're interested in that kind of nerdy data stuff, like some I am, I've been having fun uh, pulling some of this together. So, um, but with that, I am done with my portion and I would like to introduce you all to uh, referee Sidios. Uh, and she's gonna start sharing her screen um, and I will introduce her while she gets that sorted out. Uh, so referee Sidios had the honor and uh, uh, I guess it's uh, to be appointed to the uh, fourth district housing court as a referee in March of 2020, early March of 2020, which I'm sure was a delightful time to uh, get thrown into the ringer of the ever changing housing court rules. Um, I, I feel I feel that pressure as I, uh, I got brought in on this uh, into this landlord tenant law world in October of 2020 and have so seen the waves of all of the different moratoria and rules and phase outs and things that have come and gone through the last year and a half or so so um, I can sympathize with that roller coaster of uh of changing and having to relearn the new law every month or so. So, um, but before that, uh, she got her JD from the University of New Mexico Law. And uh, was, we were just talking about this uh, before we brought everyone else on. She was an assistant attorney general with the Minnesota Attorney General's Office. So without further ado, uh, welcome referee Cidios and thank you very much for joining us today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm super excited to be here. Um, I often listen to the presentations that people make, um, and so it's exciting to be here uh, presenting myself. Um, I'm going to start out just talking a little bit about updates with regards to Hennepin Housing Courts. Um, I know my colleague, uh, Referee Hotelling, was here um, maybe about six months ago or so and offered some updates at that time. So. Um, I'm going to basically just uh, sort of build on the things that she talked about and talk about anything that's different uh, from September until now. Um, <clears throat> one thing I know she mentioned was our first appearance calendars. And for those of you who are going to Hennepin County, you already know this, but we are up to uh, four regular first appearance calendars a week. Um, right now, they're being held Monday afternoon, Tuesday morning, Wednesday morning, Thursday morning. And we're starting to add a Thursday afternoon calendar. So that would be the fifth calendar in the week. Um, and I'm gonna go through some of the numbers that will explain why we're adding a fifth calendar here in just a minute. Um, for those of you who've been there, you already know this, but uh, we do uh, schedule 20 cases per calendar. Uh, that's been kind of our standard for quite a while at this point. Um, we do have a sort of new update is our SharePoint hub, which is uh, up and running and provides an information sharing space for court partners. Um, court partners need to sign up for a DMZ account or request to have access to that program or that SharePoint hub. And my understanding is that it's working pretty well. Um, <clears throat> it allows the uh, partners, the court partners to sort of talk during uh, initial appearances and coordinate um, services, which has been really great. Um, and then the million dollar question that everybody always asks about is, how long will we keep being virtual? And the answer is, I don't know. <laughs> That's the real answer. But my best guess is that we will continue to be on Zoom for the foreseeable future. Um, 
you know, I, it's really hard to say uh, what things will look like going forward. I know that um, for those of you who have heard of the other side working group at the court, um, that uh, organization uh, had made a recommendation to keep at least initial appearances in housing court virtual permanently, but I don't think there's any been, there hasn't been any final decision made on whether that will happen or not. Um, so your guess is probably as good as mine in terms of whether we'll continue to be on Zoom. Um, for those of you who haven't had a chance to go to Zoom court yet, um, you know, I would just recommend practicing before you go with Zoom if you haven't used it before. And uh, you can also feel free anytime to observe a calendar or even a trial. So if you uh, ever would like to just observe to see how things work, um, you're more than welcome to do that. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about some statistics that I was able to get uh, regarding our case numbers at the fourth. Um, so here you'll see, uh, the eviction filings just in Hennepin County and then eviction filings statewide uh, from starting in January 2019 all the way to the present. Um, you know, obviously you see this huge drop off in April of 2020. So we went from March of 2020 having 213 cases filed to 10 in April of 2020. And uh, I started with the courts in uh, February of 2020. So I got to experience a little bit of the uh, pre-pandemic uh, pre uh, busyness, but not very much. And then shortly thereafter, um, we went down to about 10 cases a month uh, or thereabouts. And you'll see that continued up until pretty low numbers up until at least uh, July of 2021, when we started to see the numbers going back up. Um, this month, I can tell you that I checked uh, the filings um, two days ago and we were, for March, we were at 315. So it seems like we are getting close to pre-pandemic numbers. Um, you can see on the chart, March 2019, we had 314 filings that month um, and we're not at the end of the month yet and we have 315. Now, the numbers here might be, it's so hard with numbers, right? They can tell lots of different stories. One of the sort of caveats about these numbers is that they do not include confidential cases or expunged cases. So um, for example, if you remember what uh, referee hotelings numbers were that were presented in September to this group, um, they are different than the numbers that I'm showing you because in the meantime, from September to now, cases have been expunged and therefore those numbers uh, have been taken out of the case filings. Couple other things. Um, the court has started tracking outcomes at initial appearances. Uh, they've been doing that since about October of 2021. So not too long, but they did have some preliminary data that they were able to give me, uh, which I thought might be interesting to people. Um, they're, according to them, their uh, number of the percentage of dismissals at first appearance calendars is about 11%. The default number is at about 28%. Settlements are about 25%. Setting of trials is 9%. Cases that have been stayed because of applications pending for Brent Help MN are approximately 16%. And then the number of cases that are continued at a first appearance hearing are about 9.5%. So um, I think that's a, a reflection of the fact that um, you know, we're still seeing a lot of applications that are pending for Brent Help MN and those cases are being stayed um, and, and or sometimes being continued so that people have a chance to complete things that they need to complete for their applications. Um, so that's kind of an update about Hennepin Housing Court in a nutshell. Uh, we do have three referees that are in housing court at this time um, <clears throat> and we are busy. <laughs> I guess I'll just say that we are, we are getting very busy again. So. Bear with us, um, we are still, and this I think goes to a question that was posed in advance in terms of how long is the eviction process taking. Um, to the best of my knowledge, we are still getting all of the hearings scheduled within seven to 14 days of filing. So I don't think we've you know, gone outside of that timeline. I do know that sometimes um, trials have been pushed out a little bit farther than maybe we would normally do them just because of a limited amount of trial spots. Um, 
and vacations. So it is uh, vacation time of the year for a lot of folks uh, with spring break here coming up. So that might be part of the reason why uh, trials are being scheduled a little bit farther out. But generally speaking, it's about a week and a half to two weeks out to get a trial date. Um, all right, so now I'm gonna just kind of turn and talk a little bit more about these uh, pre-eviction filing notices. I know that um, there's been a lot of information already presented to this group, so I don't want to um, belabor anything or, or you know, sort of go over anything that's already been covered. Um, but I did just wanna briefly sort of talk about um, some of the notice requirements um, and particularly the city ordinance ones, but we'll get to those in a minute. So first things first, um, obviously there are uh, notice requirements under state law and also based on lease agreements. Uh, there are, uh, if there are no provisions in the lease agreement saying how much notice must be given, then the law provides that the no a written notice must be received by the other party at least one full rental period before the last day of the tenancy. Um, so we talk about this a lot in courts, you know, is it 30 days, is it 28 days, is it, you know, whatever. Um, it's one rental period, so just depends, uh, but basically a month or maybe more um, before rent uh, before the last payment is due. Um, some leases spell out what kind of notice is required to end a tenancy when a lease is over. Usually it's a written notice presented like 30 to 60 days before the lease ends. Um, but for those of you who are landlords, I'm sure you're all very familiar with that uh, part of your lease agreement. Additionally, there are some federal laws and um, Rachel, I think touched on this briefly about um, the CARES Act, there's still this 30-day notice requirement under the CARES Act that have, has not yet sunsetted. I, I did not put in the HUD uh, notice, uh, written notice requirement in here, but I will note that there is also a HUD version of this. Um, it's a 30-day notice to vacate uh, prior to filing an eviction for non-payment. And I know that has been talked about a lot uh, on these webinars, so I'm not gonna go uh, through the CARES Act in detail, um, particularly since there's pretty much only one provision left that's in effect. So, um, but essentially, you know, you just need to look up to see if your, your property is covered by the CARES Act to find out if you need to provide this 30 day notice. And then now uh, we are having uh, sort of more and more uh, cities join the uh, club of requiring uh, advanced notice in eviction cases. Uh, I'm sure you all are familiar probably already with the Minneapolis 14 day notice and the St. Louis Park seven day notice. And then sort of the newcomer on the block is Brooklyn Center with their 30 day notice. So probably spend most time on that just because it's new. Um, but we'll start at the beginning. So Minneapolis, as I said, has the 14 day notice that's uh, required for non-payment cases. Uh, the landlord must provide a written notice to the tenant specifying the basis for uh, future eviction action. And then there's specific requirements that the written notice must include uh, the total amount due, a specific accounting of the amount of the total due that is comprised of unpaid rent, late fees or other charges and the name or address of the person authorized to receive uh, rent and fees on behalf of the landlord. So uh, the way we see this coming up in court is sometimes uh, we'll see a landlord has forgotten to put maybe the total amount due or perhaps the uh, next month has come and so there's a different total amount due. Um, and then obviously just sometimes people forget to give the 14 day notice entirely. So those are the probably the most common instances when we start talking about the Minneapolis city ordinance. Um, if you have been to my initial calendars, um, you know that uh, typically if I know that the case is uh, coming from Minneapolis, I always ask for the landlords to explain to me when the notice was provided. Um, as just part of my sort of regular course of business now. And I think probably most of the referees are doing that in Hennepin County as well. Um, so in terms of how to provide this notice for Minneapolis, um, the agent must, or the, the agent or the landlord must deliver the notice personally or by first class mail to the address of the lease premises. Um, the notice may in addition to, but not in place of personal delivery or first class mail be delivered by email or other electronic means to the residential tenant at the tenant's email address or electronic account on file with the landlord. So I haven't gotten a, a lot of issues on that, but we have had a few about what constitutes personal 
notice given personally um, and whether that's sort of the same standard as like service of process. Um, and so I think we'll probably see more of that issue coming up, but so far just pretty much just the once have I seen that as an issue. Next, we'll talk about the St. Louis Park Ordinance. Uh, this is a seven day notice requirement uh, for non-payment cases. Uh, they do have requirements that the notice have, uh, the total amount due, a specific accounting, and the name of the person authorized. So the same as the Minneapolis ordinance. Um, the, uh, a notice provided under the section must also provide a description of how to access legal and financial assistance and state that the owner may bring an eviction action following expiration of the seven day notice period if the tenant fails to pay the amount due or vacate. Um, again, this order, or I'm sorry, this notice must be delivered uh, personally or by first class mail to the address of the lease premises. Um, if the tenant has agreed in writing, the notice can be delivered by email. Um, so that is the seven day notice under St. Louis Park City Ordinance. And then finally, we get to the sort of most recent addition to the city ordinances regarding notice. And that is the Brooklyn Center um, City Ordinance, which was just very recently passed. I think it was at the February 28th meeting, if I'm not mistaken. Um, so the ordinance basically establishes new requirements for landlords to provide tenants with at least a 30-day notice prior to an eviction. And one distinction between this uh, city ordinance and the other two that we've already talked about is that this is not only applied to non-payment cases, but also cases uh, of material breach of lease. So that's a little bit different. Um, obviously, the time frame is also different. This is 30 days instead of seven days or 14 days. Um, you'll see here on the slide that it says that uh, this only applies to owners of affordable housing units. So affordable housing unit is defined in the Brooklyn Center code. It talks about uh, affordable housing unit being a rental unit in an affordable housing building that rents for an amount that is affordable to households at or below 80% of the area median income as median income is most recently determined by HUD. And adjusted for household size and the number of bedrooms. So that's also a little different than the other two ordinances. Um, they, uh, as I said, the first sort of provision is under for non-payment of rent case. So if there's any allegation of non-payment, a notice shall include the following information, the name, mailing address, and telephone number of the person authorized to receive rent and fees the total amount of money due and owing and a specific accounting of the money due and owing by to the owner by the tenant, including any past due rent, any late fees and other charges, and the deadline by which the total amount due and owing shall be paid to avoid an eviction action, which as we said, it's a 30 day written notice. So it has to be 30 days in advance. Now with regards to the um, notices for material breach of lease, um, a little bit different. So if there is an allegation of material breach, the notice shall at a minimum include uh, the name, mailing address and telephone number of the owner, a description of the specific conduct that the owner alleges is a violation of the lease, including dates of the violation and the persons who committed the violations, identification of the specific clause of the lease alleged to have been violated, notification that the tenant has a right to correct the alleged breach, notification of how the tenant may correct the alleged breach, the deadline by which the alleged breach shall be corrected to avoid an eviction action, which shall be no earlier than 30 days from the date on which the notice is delivered and a copy of the lease attached to the notice. So um, that is pretty extensive uh, requirements for that notice. Uh, and I'm, I haven't seen it, obviously it hasn't gone into effect yet. So I haven't seen it come into court, um, but I would imagine that uh, this might be an area where um, people make mistakes and, and don't do all of those requirements that are uh, there in, this, in the ordinance. Additionally, um, in terms of delivery for the, well, oh, I'm sorry, I should say also that there's notice, all notices under these subsections also have to have that the tenant may be evicted if they don't pay their rent or correct the breach. And then information uh, about 211 and also law help. In terms of how these notices get delivered to the tenants, the owner shall deliver any notice required by the subsection personally or by first class mail to the address of the affordable housing unit. Such notice may, in addition to, but not in place of personal delivery or delivery by first class mail, be delivered 
to any email or other electronic means. So the delivery is essentially the same as the other two city ordinances. So <laughs> I know that's a lot of information. Um, I thank you for your attention. Um, with that, I don't really have anything further. I'm happy to answer any questions. Obviously, everyone knows I can't give any legal advice, but uh, I can answer any questions about housing court or procedure, that sort of thing. Um, so we'll start there. Excellent. Thank you so much, referee. Um, it was a very detailed analysis of, of what's going on at the at housing court and, and these new ordinances that we're just getting kind of a handle on here. So um, what we're going to do next is uh, have uh, both housing attorneys, Mike Fra and Rachel Sterling jump in. And we have a, a series of questions that we got from um, registrants uh, in advance. So we'll start with those. And then uh, again, we welcome uh, participants on today's webinar to submit your questions via the, the Q&A system and uh, uh, particularly those that are uh, something that perhaps the referee can can tackle. Uh, otherwise, we'll leave the, the rest of uh, the tenant landlord related questions till the end and Mike and Rachel will tackle those. So I'll hand it over to Mike. Thanks, Eric. And thank you, referee CDS, for that informative uh, presentation. I wanted to clarify uh, one of the things that you talked about, which was the uh, personal service portion of the three city ordinances, uh, you also sort of cross-referenced uh, the, the service requirement in an eviction itself um, being somewhat analogous. You mentioned that there was a case that you had where it was contested. Can you tell us anything about what the issue was and the result? Um, <laughs> not really, because I don't remember. Uh, specifically, it's not that I don't want to tell you, but mm -hmm. um, I do remember it was an issue, perhaps, I believe, where the, the notice was emailed, but there wasn't necessarily permission on file. And then also there was a notice taped on the person's door. And the question was, is, is posting essentially on the door alone enough to constitute sure. being personally served? Yeah. Right. No, I, I've had to explain that word. I'm not sure how many times in my life, um, but I usually just say person only, right? One person has to hand it to another is the way I try to explain it to folks, but uh, that might not exactly be the legal standard, but I, I think that's one way to at least try to get it across to people. But there was another question that you, you sort of answered, but I was hoping to dive a little deeper on it, um, which was how long is the ev eviction process taking? So I, I guess I'd ask that if we just sort of walk through a hypothetical, what if a landlord were to file an eviction on April 1, for instance, just to use the start of a month, how soon before the sheriff removes them in kind of an average non-payment of rent case? Can you kind of walk through the steps and when they'd be likely to occur? Is it a default case? Sure. Well, actually, we'll say that the tenant shows up and asks for the seven days and you decide to grant it to them because of a hardship. Okay. <laughs> this is like a law school question. Sure. <laughs> it's very hard. Okay. So... Um, let's say you file your case April 1st, you're going to get your initial hearing sometime between, you know, depending on which days are weekdays, the 7th and the 14th. Um, so you'll come in for your initial appearance at that point. Let's say the tenant uh, shows up, but they don't have any legal defenses to the non-payment of rent. Um, however, they do have some kind of hardship and they present that information to the courts and we determine that there is a hardship and we grant them seven days before they have to move. Um, so at that point, the, the writ would be stayed um, for seven days. Like if, let's just say the first appearance was on April 7th. Um, does, it, does that actually happen? Or they'll I have mean, within six days of filing? It's theoretically possible. I would say probably more accurately, like let's say if you filed on the first, your hearing's probably gonna be on the 12th would be my okay. guess. <laughs> okay, we'll use that. Okay, and then you'll come in on the 12th and I'll say, uh, you have a hardship, let's give you seven more days. And so for me, that would be the 19th, would be the writ uh, would be issued on the 19th and then uh, go to the sheriff. I don't really honestly don't know what the sheriff lead times are right now. It seems to be sort of all over the place a little bit. Sometimes it seems to be going fast and sometimes it seems to be going slow. So somebody else might have better source of information and, on that. And maybe you don't even really get involved after the writ is issued. That's probably the last thing you really have to oversee. So the, I mean, the, I know the general rule is the sheriff will come out and put a note on the door saying the landlord has or the tenant has 24 hours to vacate. 
24 hours pass. If the tenant hasn't left, the landlord goes back to the sheriff and says, they haven't left, let's schedule a move out. So it could be another four to seven days, I suppose. But I, I assume, because I, I know that, that you guys give speeches to a lot of different groups, that you've given speeches to landlord groups before. Um, and whenever I talk to landlord groups and I ask that question, how long does an eviction take? Typically the answers I get are six months or a year. And I, I just don't know where they're getting that guess from unless you have a landlord that waits six months to file an eviction. And then it takes another month after that. Uh, and they feel like they were sort of in the eviction process, but it's really a 20 to 30 day process for an average eviction, right? That is my experience of it. I, I don't know. I mean, the only thing I can think of is maybe if they are counting the time, for example, if they had to give a 30 day notice okay. and they're going backwards uh, that way, or if they came to their first appearance and their case got dismissed because they didn't do service properly sure. or some other kind of issue like that. So they had to come back to court. Um, those things do happen. Uh, so that could be the case, but generally speaking, if you're doing everything right and all the paperwork, you know, your I's are dotted and your T's are crossed. Um, yeah, it's more like a 20 to 30 day process. Thanks. All right, I think my turn to hop in on the question train. Um, thank you. So uh, you kind of touched on this as well, but uh, Cassandra is a tenant and is wondering uh, the written 14 day pay or vacate requirements is email okay and it sounds like for Minneapolis specifically talks about it but do St. Louis Park or Brooklyn Center talk about that at all specifically. Yeah, um, so the Minneapolis and the Brooklyn uh, Center ones are very similar, um, so it says that for delivery. Um, you, you have to personally deliver or deliver by first class mail, uh, but they can be delivered by email uh, or any other electronic means at the tenant's email address or electronic account. I'm not even sure what that means, but maybe like a portal. Um, but that would be in addition to either delivering it personally or by sending first class mail. Um, in terms of like just the under state law, whether or not um, notice could be given by email, you know, I don't see anything in the definition section of 504B that would sort of give us idea one way or the other, uh, whether email would be okay. But, you know, I think sort of my perspective would be that probably best practice is to, to give people a, a written notice that you can then attach to your complaint when you want to come into court. Um, you know, email or text message is a little bit dicey sometimes. So I think the best practice would be to just do the, the letter and uh, then you're you're good to go and you can attach it to your complaint. Thank you for that. And to clarify, you're talking about slightly two different notices about, you know, the notice of I don't want to renew your lease anymore and, or I want to end your lease between the landlord and the tenant and the notice that is required under some of these cities um, or the CARES Act or HUD properties that's for pre-eviction. Right, so it's it's two different scenarios. Correct. Yep. Okay. okay, I have. I think this is kind of a multi-part question, and uh, it's coming from a city staffer from St. Louis Park, where they have one of the ordinances that we're talking about. And uh, by the way, if you're submitting a question, I noticed that somebody else just submitted a question where they put in parentheses after their name, they were a landlord, which is great. It helps us kind of frame the question, figuring out what somebody's trying to ask us. Anyhow, uh, this question from the city staffer is. Uh, have housing referees been upholding any eviction actions in subsidized housing? And I'll, I'll finish the whole question. You can pick out the parts you wanna answer. Uh, public housing is required by HUD to be smoke free. Are housing court referees upholding evictions based on violations of the smoking policy in public housing? This goes on. With the end of the eviction moratorium, with the exception of pending rent help cases, are referees upholding eviction for repeated lease violations for late rent in market rate units or subsidized units? So a lot there. And I'll repeat any part of it if you need me to. Okay, yeah. So, I mean, I, I'm assuming what they mean by upholding evictions is it, that we're holding trials on those issues and then making a determination whether or not the person should be evicted. Um, so if that's, if my interpretation of that part is correct, then yes, I mean, we do, we are holding trials. We're holding trials with regards to public housing. 
Um, we are, I have had trials regarding the smoking issue specifically um, because that does come up quite a bit. Um, and then we're just, you know, I mean, we're looking at, is, has there been a material uh, breach of the lease agreement by the smoking? And so that is definitely an issue that comes up and an issue that we make decisions about um, in housing court. Um, trying to think of at the end of the eviction motion. Is there pending real? Another one was the, uh, the late rents in market rate units. Can, will you uphold an eviction for repeated lease violations for late rent in a market rate unit? Yes, yes, uh, we will. So if there's a late rent, um, with the caveat that um, the person doesn't have a rent help MN application pending. So if they do have a pending application, then I, it would be likely that the case would be stayed. Um, but if not, then it would go forward. So what, what if the lease had a provision? So we have a, our standard late fee provision. On the fifth, you have to pay an extra $50, let's say. But later in the lease, it says if there are four or more late violations, uh, then that is considered a material breach of the lease, which is not a common lease term, but it certainly exists. What, how would that go? Or have you seen that? Yeah, that's a good question. I was answering the easy part of that, <laughs> that question. I don't blame you. <laughs> and that, you. You are asking me now the harder part of that question because I think it does get a little tricky if the person has a uh, application pending for rent help. Um, I, you know, I, I can't say how any particular case would go, but I have seen um, it's sort of gone both ways. Uh, sometimes it'll be allowed and sometimes it will be stayed depending on the referee. So I, I can't give you a really like firm answer one way or the other on that question. Okay. All right, fantastic, thank you. I'm gonna jump over to some of the uh, questions that were submitted during the uh, webinar. Um, so I, I think that Joy sent this question in actually while I was talking, but I think that this is also applicable to all of the things that you've been talking about, referee. Uh, so Joy is asked, saying that these rules don't apply to lease non-renewals, right? Just the actual eviction process. Um, so. Yeah, so I think if we're talking about the city ordinance, uh, notice requirements, then it is just for uh, non-payment. And then in the case of Brooklyn Center, it's non-payment or breach, material breach. Okay, thank you. Okay, um, why do I get the long questions? Okay, uh, this is, uh, here we go. Let's assume a tenant, you can see it in the q and I assume as well, referees, so you can follow along. Let's assume a tenant has an application pending for rent but only through, for example, January of 2022. Then the tenant doesn't pay February or later rent. Um, have you had any cases where the landlord brings an eviction action for failure to pay February and later rent, and the tenant claims that the case should be stayed because they have the pending application for January rent? Uh, and then they ask, what is the case and how is it decided? But... Okay, so that's another hard question. <laughs> Thank you, uh, Ms. Wilson Legg. Um, I'm sure you know you may have seen this in court. I certainly have seen this come up before uh, in court, um, where somebody has a pending application, and maybe it's for different months, or maybe it just doesn't cover the full amount that's owed because they've reached sort of the cap of how much money they can get. Um, those issues do come up from time to time, and I think it's an open question. I mean, the the Phase out legislation says that if there's a pending application, the eviction case has to be stayed. Um, it doesn't say if there's a pending application for all of the amounts due, the case has to be stayed. But it's also kind of a logical conclusion that if there is additional amounts that are due and owing that would not be covered by the, um, let's just say the rent help application uh, was approved in full, but there's these additional amounts that would not be covered, I think. It is a, a difficult question um, and, and not answered the same by all referees. I'll say that. Can I follow up with it? I, I just realized that these meetings had to have happened and I'm not sure who was all involved in them over the last two years. But 
we've seen so many changes in the law. And so <laughs> when 20-79 came out in August of 2021, who got together and who tried to figure out, all right, is that really what the governor meant? Are we sure that we understand? I mean, who, who would be involved in trying to figure that out? Or did you go case by case as the cases were presented? How, how did that, how do we understand these brand new laws that we don't have any precedents for get done? Did you talk to folks in Ramsey County as well? I mean, what kind of information sharing or theory sharing was done at the judicial level? You don't have to tell me the content, just kind of how it was reached. Yeah, no, I mean, that's a good question. I think um, at the beginning of the pandemic, probably like lots of other workplaces, there was a certain amount of panic and confusion, <laughs> at least for me personally, um, in trying to figure out and navigate sort of this new way, first of all, of doing things on Zoom, and second of all, with these new executive orders that came about. Um, I certainly had consultations with folks from Ramsey County, um, from housing court over there. Um, I also, um, you know, there is some amount of information that we get from state court administration about new laws that are enacted um, where they'll, you know, do some uh, preliminary sort of review of those laws and the impact of them. So we'll get some information from state courts. Um, and then a lot of times for those of you, I know there's a lot of attorneys here. I'm sure you've been, if you've been in my courtroom, you've probably seen me scratching my head and saying like, how, how do you think I should interpret this? Because there's there's no definition section, there's no case law, there, there's um, you know very very sort of limited guidance on on the two executive orders, and even I mean I think the phase out legislation was slightly slightly more clear, but it was still very confusing. So um, yeah, I mean I guess I just. Thank you to thanks to all of our uh, attorneys that have been in court with us the last two years sort of struggling through this because I really, uh, it was a difficult time and not necessarily any easy answers out there. And, and like, not likewise, but a similar question is how often were you asked these types of questions by a judge from Polk County? Did they call you guys up and say, I think you do a lot more evictions than everybody else. So is this what this means? I'm not sure. You get those kind of calls? Yes, absolutely. Mm -hmm. We get those kind of calls. And it was definitely, uh, we got a lot more of those kind of calls. I knew when they were asking me for advice and I had only been at the court for like a couple of months that <laughs> there might be an issue because um, there's just there's just so many questions coming in um, from other counties about how we're supposed to do this stuff. So, yeah. Thank you for that. Um, I actually have a, a quick question as well about what um, you had mentioned just briefly that a uh, if there was a pending uh, application with one of those programs that uh, you would stay the case. So is that typical through for all the referees that if there's a pending application that um, the case isn't necessarily dismissed, but it's, it's stayed? Or can you kind of walk us through what that means or what that process looks like in those sort of circumstances? Sure, absolutely. So um, what happens at the first appearance calendar is if the tenant tells us or the landlord tells us that they have a pending rent help application, um, you know, basically what the phase out legislation requires us to do is stay the case. Uh, there's also been some controversy around whether the case should be made confidential or not. Um, I'm not going to really go into that, but um, occasionally uh, cases have been made confidential um, when they're stayed, but they're not generally dismissed. Um, they're generally just stayed. And then what happens is the language we have in our order is something like they're stayed until June 1st of 2022, or there's a decision on the application for rent help, whichever date comes first. And then uh, in a sort of interest of self-preservation, we also include a language in our order that says, if we don't hear from anybody by June 15th, the case will be administratively dismissed. And if they're administratively dismissed, does that also get an expungement or is that a separate step? That would be a separate step. Okay, thank you. Uh, okay, and then I will, looks like we've got uh, one more question uh, about notice from Michael, who is the landlord. Uh, 
And they're saying uh, regarding notice for email, uh, does the required signed authorization, I, I, sorry, I don't actually, uh, regarding notice with email, does, re, does it require signed authorization by resident to receive? So I guess in the, in the ordinance, I know in Minneapolis, it says that there has to be some sort of written authorization to send the pre-eviction notice via email. Does that have to be a signed authorization or can they also agree to that via email or, or how does that authorization work? Any, any experience with that so far? That issue has not come up for me. I think that's an interesting question. Can you agree by email to be served by email? <laughs> um, it's like a chicken and egg kind of problem. But um, I mean, the language of the Minneapolis ordinance says that the notice may in addition to, but not in place of personal delivery or first class mail be delivered by email or other electronic means to the residential tenant at the tenant's email address or electronic account on file with the landlord. And I think the language in um, Brooklyn Center is similar and St. Louis Park looks, okay, St. Louis Park is sort of the different one, I guess, where it says the owner or an agent of the owner must deliver the notice personally or by first class mail to the address of the lease premises. If the tenant has agreed in writing, notice may deliver, may be delivered by email to the residential tenant at the tenant's email address on file. So I don't see it saying that it has to be signed, but it says the tenant has to agree in writing. So. Which, it's a good question whether that's uh, email, text, hieroglyphic, uh, saying, <laughs> <laughs> right. stone so, tablets. I mean, <laughs> you know, these are the kind of things, so who knows? I mean, if a, if a landlord came in and said, I have a text message from a tenant that says, I agree, uh, as the tenant that you can deliver any notices to me uh, about this tenancy by email. I mean, would that be sufficient? I, I don't know. I mean, that's a case by case kind of determination, but. Absolutely. Thank you. Next question is from an anonymous source um, asking about changing the caption to John or Jane Doe versus confidential. Um, I'm not exactly sure what they mean by confidential versus expunged, dismissed. I mean, I guess maybe you could just sort of sort through those definitions, uh, but their concern is, can a case still be searchable by address or property? Is, is anything really confidential? I guess is what they're asking, partly. Yeah, so that's a good question. There is a lot of confusion sort of around the different terminology that the court uses um, to make things private or secret or however you want to describe it. Um, when a case, at least in Hennepin County, when a case is made confidential, it means that um, nobody can find that case by searching any criteria. So by the name, by the address, they wouldn't be able to find that particular case anymore. Um, if it's expunged, same thing, basically. The difference between expungement and confidentiality is that confidentiality can be reversed. So it can be made public again, whereas expungement can't be reversed once it's done, it's gone, and we don't even have access to it as judicial officers. Um, the caption changes. Um, so yes, I mean, that people do request that uh, quite a bit, um, having caption changes to John or Jane Doe. Um, they are still somewhat findable in the system because there's nothing about the case that makes it um, go away or makes it um, hidden from public view. It just changes the name on the caption. So if, for example, somebody looked at the complaint um, that was, you know, had the original person's tenant's name on it, it would still be there. So hopefully that helps a little bit, but I know it's, it's a confusing thing. Thanks. Yeah. And I don't, I don't know how often confidential was used before COVID um, by the housing courts. Certainly not as much as it has been since then. Yeah, not very often. I mean, the only kind of instance I can remember was sometimes we would have people that were participating in the safe at home program. Sure. And we would make those cases confidential, but that's the only thing I can really think of. I awesome. uh, got a, another uh, anonymous question um, asking, how has housing court been dealing with rent posting and things like rent escrow actions? Has the explosion in need for rental assistance and or the payments from rent help changed the approach in cases where rent is generally required to be posted in court? Ooh, this is a good question too. Um, 
you know, I can't say in any particular case, but generally speaking, um, you know, we do see this a lot uh, in terms of, you know, people maybe have a rent help application pending and they're also filing a uh, rent escrow action in courts. And it could be that they haven't, I mean, we've certainly seen cases where people haven't been able to pay rent for six months to a year, uh, but they are trying to work that rent help application process and get the rent paid back. Um, in generally speaking, uh, in cases like that, I wasn't requiring posting um, if there was this pending rent help application um, for rent escrow cases. However, um, you know, posting, it plays an important role in a rent escrow case. And so without having, without the court having those funds on hand, we have sort of less uh, leverage, if you will, over uh, landlords that are perhaps, uh, you know, not doing the repairs that they need to be doing. So it is kind of a um, double-edged sword, if you will, because without having any money in escrow, uh, it definitely makes it harder for the court to enforce our orders. So, I, you know, I don't know how everyone, you know, across the state has been handling those rent escrow cases, but generally speaking, my practice is to not require posting if they had rent help applications pending for that, for the specific months that were owed. I think this is an easy one. Finally, a short question for me. Um, <laughs> They want to know how affordable housing units are defined in the Brooklyn Center 30-day notice, which I think you talk, talked about earlier, but if you don't mind just covering that again. Yeah, sure. So they do define affordable housing unit in the ordinance, and it's a rental unit in affordable housing building that rents for an amount that is affordable to households at or below 80% of the area median income. So that's, that's the definition from the ordinance. And the, I mean, the ordinance isn't even... I don't think it's, when does it take effect, Rachel? I know you had contact with the April city. April 9th. Right, so you yes. haven't had any cases in front of you based on that ordinance yet, yeah. Sorry, I now have the very long question uh, from an attorney and I don't actually think that Paul is has a question, um, but more a, uh, Paul is an attorney I who, uh, has offered up a, uh, looks like a case uh, regarding uh, the definition of what personal service means. So um, uh, I'm just, I don't know, I don't know that I want to read all of it because it has a lot of caption information in it, but in a nutshell, uh, what I'm understanding is that uh, the issue was what was a copy of the statement is served personally or by certified mail on the owner mean and the court held that anyone even the party themselves could serve the notice um, is not required uh, third party service isn't required under 514.08 which is a statute number so as to what physical event was required the court said personal service requires only actual delivery of the notice and does not restrict who may make personal service. So supporting what you said, Mike. Well, I'm is always what happy when Paul, Paul is saying. <laughs> when, when Paul endorses what I say, and I'm not sure if you know Paul Bernberg, a referee CDS. He used to work in our office and was in housing law for a long time, and he hasn't completely succeeded in retiring from this work. So <laughs> he, he likes to chime in on things, but uh, I'm sure that it's a, a good legal argument. Uh, I think what he's saying is, unlike an eviction, it doesn't have to be a third party service, but it does have to be personal, is his contention, I think, which I think might be the right answer. I don't know. We'll see when you guys get a case on it. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know either. So we'll see. <laughs> and I had a couple other questions of my own, if you don't mind. Um, I'm always fascinated to talk to a housing court referee because it's just a different take on, on this world. And one of the things that I've always not envied about the position is um, you're not conciliation court, but I'm not sure what other court has as high a percentage of pro se litigants as housing court does, certainly in the core counties when it comes to evictions. Uh, how, do you, how do you manage that? Uh, how do you manage pro se litigants? I mean, what's sort of your philosophy on how to make it fair but formal uh, to, I mean, so I'm sure you have cases where both the landlord and the tenant are unrepresented. 
And um, I'm sure you've had trials like that. How do you actually get yourself ready for that? What tips do you give those folks? Okay, so good question. <laughs> I like that question because nobody, uh, I don't think anybody's ever asked me that question really. And the thing I've found over just the last two years is that it's not a one size fit all kind of thing. Um, I didn't know that before I became a referee. You know, you sort of think like you go in, you do the same thing over and over and over again. But actually, um, you really do have to sort of take your audience into account and figure out what uh, sort of uh, mechanism is going to work best for the folks that are in front of you, if they're represented or unrepresented or one side is represented and one side is not. That whole thing um, is something I think a lot about uh, before I even go into the courtroom. And I'm talking specifically about trials. Um, you know, first appearance calendars are so uh, busy and chaotic. I don't have a lot of time to think about them, but if we're going into a trial, I will give some thought ahead of time to, um, you know, what makes sense? How are we gonna make this work? Um, you know, if, if there's, um, I do have a handout for pro se litigants that has, for example, a list of general legal objections to questions um, that I'll give out uh, sometimes in advance, um, particularly uh, if people, sometimes, you know, people really are excited to make objections because they've seen it on TV so or wherever they've seen it in court before. And so um, they'll go ahead and just be making objections left and right. And I'll be like, hold on, hold on, hold on. We can't just say objection, I don't like what this other person said. It has to be a, a legal objection and here's a list of what those could be. Um, and I think it's just really important to sort of meet people where they are. Um, before coming to uh, the attorney general's office, I worked at legal aid for about a decade. And so I dealt with a lot of folks who would end up eventually being pro se or representing themselves in court, just giving them advice, helping them prepare for court and that sort of thing. And so. It is really interesting to sort of be on the other side of that, but also I think it's it's been an advantage to me to be able to uh, hopefully communicate effectively. And that's something that I do think really hard about is like, how do I explain what a motion for summary judgment is to somebody who's not a lawyer, for example? Um, <laughs> because it, it's, you know, there's and there's a lot of things like that in the law that are, um, they don't necessarily make sense to a lay person. And <laughs> they shouldn't make sense because they don't actually make sense except for we all went to law school. So we understand what it means now. But um, that is something um, I do I do work at quite a bit is trying to make sure that the court is accessible for people without lawyers. Um, it's supposed to be, I mean, that's how it's supposed to be is that housing court is a place where people can come and get relief quickly and you know, likely without an attorney. That being said, there are certain rules, you know, for example, like service rules that we uh, have strict compliance with, and those are tricky. And I always, you know, feel a little bad about that uh, when we have to dismiss a case because there was some sort of minor technical issue. But, you know, at the end of the day, that's also my job is to uphold the, the law. So, yeah, it's, it's, a, it's interesting <laughs> and varied, let's put it that way. Thank you. Thank you for all that. Uh, we did get a couple of questions in the chat uh, that were kind of uh, missed in the hustle and bustle. So um, we're pulling those out now. Uh, if you do have questions, though, I will say, um, please, again, use the Q&A uh, function. Those are much easier for us to see. We don't miss them. Um, so if you um, please, Q&A is the better option instead of the chat if possible. But uh, Nicole is asking, uh, can a landlord send you a letter of possible eviction uh, if you have a pending application? Um, so I think that's the pre-eviction notice if you have a pending like emergency as rental assistance application like rent help. I don't know, uh, Rachel, maybe you want to answer that question. It just sounds a little like legal advice, so I don't want to. I suppose, it, well, it's more, I guess, my thought was in the, um, there's no, if there's anything in the ordinances that would prevent a landlord from sending that notice to um, a, a tenant uh, for non-payment. Like, I guess the question is, do the notices, 
the landlord doesn't have to file an eviction if they've given the notice, right? So like if there's like, if you know, here's your 14 day notice if you're in uh, Minneapolis. And so if you, you know, yeah, but you don't have to file an eviction. So, but I think what the person is wondering is if, if they have a pending application, is the landlord barred from even sending those notices for a pre-eviction filing? So I think that's a question then about uh, the phase-out legislation um, Suppose, and whether yeah. or not it prevents you from filing a case if you mm -hmm. know that there's a pending application. I think I think it does prevent a landlord from filing a new eviction case if they know that there is a pending rent help application. Um, if you know it hasn't, if it's not pending, or, or you know, we and we just see that quite a bit where the landlord finds out for the first time at the initial appearance that there's a pending application for rent help. And there's a lot of different iterations of how that happens. Sometimes it's um, that the application wasn't filed until after eviction was filed. And then in that 14 day window before their first appearance, it does get filed. Um, yeah, or yeah, there's lots of lots of different scenarios, but generally mm -hmm. speaking, I think the phase out legislation prohibits you from filing a case if if there is a pending application and you're aware of it. And, and my understanding from uh, my work with the phase out is doesn't prevent the notices from happening. And from what I've seen of the ordinances, there's nothing in the ordinances that would prevent the note those notices from being sent out, regardless of whether there's a rent help application or an emergency assistance rep application through a county or something like that. Okay. Uh, we have a, I'm not exactly sure what this is. I think it's the owner of a property. I, I also was looking through that one and I couldn't quite tell. This yeah. one might be I, a little bit more I think complicated. It's a purchase to maybe a rent to, rent to own or a contract for deed. I'm not sure. But I think I can summarize the question as I think it's a homeowner who's in a contract for deed or rent to own who wants to know what resources are out there for them to get help with dealing with a, a problem resident who may or may not be a tenant. I'm not exactly sure. I assume that you see those, right? Contract for deed, cancellations, uh, evictions, uh, rent to owns that have gone bad. So the final phase is. I assume evictions in both cases. We don't actually advise on those. So I'm not really sure about the process. Um, we don't see them a lot, but we do see them from time to time. Uh, cancellations on contract for deed, um, you know, or rent to own when they go bad. Um, it comes in in lots of different interesting ways. Um, sometimes I've had uh, landlords in court who didn't realize that they had like given title of their property to someone else on a rent to own type of thing. Um, so it, it always comes in in some kind of very convoluted, <laughs> confusing way. So I don't know that I can really um, answer the question other than to say, um, you know, if you can get a lawyer to give you advice, that's what I would do. <laughs> Right, and Elizabeth, who submitted the original question, uh, clarified saying uh, she bought the home outright and gave the former owner a rent back to get him through the winter. So I, I have a much better sense of what this is now. I don't have any more advice on where to go other than what you just said. I think a real estate attorney that uh, works in this world is worth consulting with to figure out what options they actually have here. That would be my advice. I'm guessing that's what you'd say as well, or just did say. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> All right. Are, are there others, Rachel, that we have in the queue? Because I still had a couple more questions of mine, and I don't know if you had some of your own. Uh, that is it for the specific um, questions for referee Sedios. There are a couple pre-submitted ones that are more for you and I, Mike, okay. but sure. um, if you've got some questions for referee Sedios, I, right. if, if she has the time, I would encourage those. Okay. So you mentioned the kind of the scale of evictions, uh, both in Hennepin County and statewide. That's not all you hear, though. You hear, what other kinds of cases do you hear in housing court? Yeah, um, so we hear um, tenant-initiated actions like rent escrows, um, tenant remedies actions, uh, lockout cases, uh, which are tenant-brought cases. Um, 
we hear commercial eviction cases in Hennepin County. Uh, we hear, um, I feel like I'm forgetting something. Um, this contract for deed or foreclosure cases, yeah. we do hear those as well. Um, I think that's about it, but we see a lot of very different, interesting things all the time. <laughs> what, what percent of the work is tenant initiated litigation that you see? I mean, you don't mm -hmm. hear, uh, for instance, security deposit cases, those are done in conciliation courts. So the, the ETRAs, the rent escrows, the lockouts, how, how many of those are there in Hennepin County? That's a good question. I don't have the exact numbers on that. So it would just be sort of, you know, a winging it. Yeah, yeah, best guess. So yeah. don't hold me to this. But I would say my work, I probably do maybe like 5% tenant initiated cases. Okay. Okay. So earlier you talked about where we end up. I mean, you only spent, it sounds like a few weeks in the normal times of housing court. And so you got to see sort of what the calendar looked like that back then and what it is now. If you were in charge of designing what happens next, let's say COVID goes away tomorrow, the courts can do whatever they want. Should initial hearings be Zoom optional for, for both parties? Uh, or is that not what you think is best in the interest of justice? I mean, you've seen the crowds you know, crammed into those rooms, which is almost an impossible concept to imagine still that we would forcibly overbook courtrooms and people don't always have daycare for their kids. Um, what, what do you, if you were picking, what would you design uh, going forward with that option? Okay, so with the caveat that it is not up to me <laughs> and, and I'm sure whoever is in charge of this is doing the best they possibly can. Sure. Um, if I had a magic wand and I could do whatever I wanted, I would suggest um, hiring more referees and allowing all the cases to be hybrid, which would be either people can come in person or attend on Zoom, uh, whichever works better for them. I do think that Zoom has opened up a lot of opportunities for people to appear in court that otherwise wouldn't have appeared um, because of the things you mentioned, like daycare and um, work. Uh, you know, we definitely get people that are at work calling into their Zoom hearings quite a bit. So um, they, you know, I don't know if they would have been able to take the day off or they just wouldn't have shown up and they would have been defaulted. And so I do think um, there is a place for Zoom, hopefully in the future. Uh, because I do think it provides um, sort of more access to justice for people. And I think, you know, both landlords and tenants really like it <laughs> um, for the most part, not everybody, but for the most part, I do think it's a, it's been sort of a popular over time, not at first, but over time has grown in popularity um, and that it would be hard to go back probably to all in person um, after doing things remotely for so long. That being said, there are, for some people, challenges with regards to the technology. Uh, it could be, you know, their phone connection isn't good or they just don't know how to work Zoom. I mean, that does happen, we see that. And so for that reason, I think it would be preferable to have an option for people to come in person. But there's like a lot of um, things that are sort of, uh, I don't know if you'd say above my pay grade or <laughs> whatever you wanna, however you wanna term it, but there would be a, have to be a lot of um, sort of reallocation of resources to make something like that happen. So it's it's a dream, but I don't know that it's a dream that's going to be fulfilled. Well, it's an interesting conversation to be able to even have. I mean, two years ago, this would have been somewhat unthinkable. Courts just being electronic and people wondering if that's the best way to go. There's no way that the judiciary, which doesn't change fast, you can say whatever you want about the judiciary, but it's not known for fast change would even consider that, but now it's a forced conversation, which is maybe good going forward for, like you said, access to justice. Um, you also mentioned that you're upping the number of referees in Hennepin County. So I, I assume from what you were saying that you're a full-time housing court referee at this point, right? Um, not exactly. No. <laughs> no, none of us are full-time housing court referees in the sense that all three of us have other assignments. So I do harassments as well. Um, referee uh, hoteling does petty misdemeanor cases. She also does harassments. And I think I'm forgetting one of her other assignments. And then referee Reed uh, does uh, criminal expungements. Um, I think he does petty misdemeanors as well, housing and 
I'm probably forgetting something else that he does. <laughs> I don't know. Harassments. Oh yeah, he does harassments too. So we all are kind of splitting our time between different areas, but. Um, but there's going to be another referee added for an additional block you're, you're set. I thought you said that earlier. No, no, sorry. I, I, I don't know, maybe I wasn't clear about that. There's an afternoon calendar on Thursdays that's being added, but that, that would be added to my schedule. I see. Yeah. So you're hoping that there would be more referees added in the future. <laughs> that would be great. Yes, we would love that, but not that I'm aware of. And do you think that there will be a sixth and seventh calendar to the week added at the rate we're going? Is that being talked about? I mean, it's certainly, um, you know, something that we've talked about. I, you know, it really just depends on what the case volume looks like. It's just a, it's a very, you know, tricky situation because on Zoom, we've really figured out that we can't do a lot more than 20 cases on a calendar just because of the sort of time limitations. Um, whereas in person, as I'm sure you remember, we did uh, between 40 and 45 cases on a calendar. So how do we, um, you know, sort of keep up with the volume of cases that are coming in while still doing them on Zoom and having sort of half as many that can be heard in the same period of time? Is a is a challenge that we're talking about daily, basically, and trying to figure out how do we how do we do that. Um, I have another kind of rent help related question about just some of the cases that you may have seen throughout. Um, I know we only have a couple minutes left, so I want to make sure to get it in. Uh, but uh, have you seen any cases uh, that the landlord has been alleging non-payment, but the non-payment was for months that rent help had already covered those months. So like, um, you know, say that the alleging non-payment for February of 2022, but rent help had paid out through you know, December, Fe January, and February. Um, and if so, how did those work? Um, did the tenant or the rent help staff help provide information at the hearing or how did that kind of, how do those cases tend to go if there's rent help involved? Okay, so um, I think the answer is yes, we have seen some of that. I, I can't say that I've seen very often, but there has been a few instances when uh, that has been an issue that's been raised. Um, we do have folks uh, from rent assistance at our first, our initial appearance calendars, and they are super great and very helpful at looking up people's applications on the spot. So if there is a question about whether somebody has a pending application or whether it's been paid out or whether it's been denied or whether it's on appeal, things like that, um, we definitely turn to our uh, partners at rent assistance to help us look into that and try to figure it out. Um, you know, the other thing is obviously a lot of tenants are now getting representation in Hennepin County at Housing Court uh, through services provided by ARS and uh, MMLA and BLN. Um, and so, uh, you know, they'll have an advocate um, who will look into that and figure out what's going on. If somebody, if a, if a landlord is trying to sue somebody for money that's not owed, obviously, I mean, a case would generally be dismissed if there was no basis for the complaint. But. Thank you for that. I, I think that might be it for our questions for the referee. And we've taken up almost all of the time that she graciously offered to us. Thank you so much for this. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was great to visit with everybody. And I, I am often a spectator here. So it's, it's very exciting to be on the sort of other side of the camera. So thank you for having me. Excellent. Thank you so much, referee. Uh, this has been very informative, and I know um, I know a lot of folks that uh, if they haven't caught it today, they they will be watching the recording. As uh, we did get a few questions that are not uh, specific to tenant landlord law, and also some that are that are not uh, that that I think Rachel and Mike are going to tackle here in just a second. But I did want to just answer those couple questions right now. Um, we will be posting a recording of today's um, webinar on our website at the same link where you, um, on our website where you may have registered and we'll send that information out in advance, or sorry, after uh, once it's up. We are also going to apply, uh, since we did get a number of inquiries about it, we'll, we, we have not yet applied, but we will apply for CLE credit for today. 
And um, if and when that is approved, we will notify uh, any attendees via email. Um, the PowerPoint, um, as long as it's okay with uh, referee Sedios, we will post a PDF copy of the slides uh, along with the recording on our website. Um, I think that was all the logistical things. Um, so uh, just a, uh, just maybe two or three, oh no, just two more, two or three more questions left that are more tenant landlord related. Um, the first one is uh, we, we have kind of answered, but we'll just re reiterate again, uh, Catherine, uh, who's a tenant says, I'm late on my rent and I need assistance. Would one of you want to tackle that or? I got that. <laughs> I'll take the easy one. Um, well, uh, we always suggest that if folks are looking to get rental assistance uh, to contact 211, uh, that's the United Way. Uh, if you're in the metro area, just calling 211, uh, that program will help direct you to what assistance is available in your area. Um, otherwise, your county is also going to be probably the best option to also reach out to for that sort of assistance. Uh, we did also mention a couple of uh, county specific uh, rental uh, COVID-19 emergency rental assistance programs. So if you're in Ramsey or Washington, you can also look into those. Thank you, Rachel. And I posted again a link to our phase out page, which um, if, if you scroll down a bit, there are links to those. The, we, and we'll try to keep that as updated as possible. The, the couple remaining ERA programs in Ramsey and Washington where tenants can actively apply. Um, there's links to that on our phase out page. Um, somebody is asking, what about the chat and Q&A as part of the recording? Um, the, yeah, I mean, the, the video will be there. We can maybe pull the chat and uh, attach it to the um, attachments on the uh, recording as well. All right, um, next question is from Annette, who's a tenant. What are the laws for landlords to shovel and salt the driveway and their property? Are the, are the, is the landlord required to do this for garage entry? Right. So, uh, and this is one of the things, believe it or not, that lawyers do. Uh, I actually pulled up the statute that I thought was most relevant and was checking the language of it as I knew that the question was going to come to me. Um, even though that this is the kind of work I do, and I've looked at this statute probably every week for the last 25 years, but I still looked it up um, because I wanted to confirm one part of it, which is, uh, and what I'm looking at, by the way, and I don't like to quote statutes specifically, but sometimes it's the only way to do this. Uh, 504B. That's the chapter of landlord tenant law that we care about. Uh, 504B.161 in Minnesota statutes talks about not just the premises, which is the rental itself, but all common areas are fit for the use intended by the parties. So that's my starting analysis of this question. Is there a state law that requires the landlord to take care of salting driveways and, and property near a garage? And I think that's the best argument you'd make, uh, it, certainly under the state law is that yes, the, the, what we call the covenants of habitability built into that statute, that specific statute, require the landlord to maintain the property in those spaces. There may be a city code as well. Uh, it's not easy to know the answer to that. I would probably bet against it as most city codes that, that regulate um, things like sidewalks stop at the sidewalk. They don't necessarily go into the private driveway. So there's a chance that the city code wouldn't address that. But could a tenant file, for instance, a rent escrow, which we heard about from referee CDS earlier, for a landlord failing to maintain the parking lot in the area around the garages in a building complex and make sure it's safe and relatively free of ice during the cold weather months, which thankfully were kind of through that ice season. Um, I think, yeah, I think that a tenant could require that uh, a landlord make those kinds of repairs and uh, probably file a rent escrow. All right, um, two more questions here. Uh, and this one was kind of covered, but we'll just ask it again and uh, maybe Rachel can jump through it. Uh, it. Sounds like the landlord, Ali, is asking how to proceed with eviction. When did the moratorium officially end? I will take the last part of that first. Um, so uh, the moratorium, it depends on which moratorium we're talking about. There were several over the course of the whole pandemic. Um, the federal one, um, there was one that was imposed with the CARES Act that ended in July of 2020. The Minnesota one, which I'm assuming is what you're talking about, 
uh, ended technically with the phase out. Um, so that went into place on June 30th of 2021. I think I've got the exact date right. It was June 2021. Um, and so, and what I, that did was slowly lift some of the restrictions that the moratorium had put in place. So the moratorium itself uh, under executive order 2079 ended in June of 2021. And then the uh, some of the restrict a lot of most of the restrictions were done by October of 2021. Um, and then there's just this one that is left is left um, that will expire at the end of May uh, of 2022. Um, so it goes through, it says it expires on June 1st of 2022 is what it says. And that's for the protection from eviction for non-payment of rent for folks who have a pending application with a qualifying emergency rental assistance program. That's a lot of caveats to throw into one sentence. I'm sorry. Um, as to how to proceed with an eviction, that's something that you'll probably want to speak to a, a landlord attorney about um, all the specifics about when, if your situation qualifies under an eviction requirement or not. Um, that is also going to you know, keep in mind as what referee Sidios was talking about today, um, whether there's some pre-eviction notices um, involved either at the federal or local level. So again, if I would definitely recommend speaking to a lawyer, um, a landlord lawyer about your particular situation. Thanks, Rachel. And, and the fun, uh, maybe it's not fun, but the historical fact for the day is that it was uh, two years ago today that Governor Walls issued Executive Order 20-14, which was the first order that suspended evictions and lease term, landlord initiated lease terminations beginning at 5 p.m. the next day. So it was two years ago today. Um, I got a couple of messages from folks uh, asking to get su subscribed so they can hear about future um, webinars. Um, we do have a uh, newsletter that is now monthly, uh, where we will try to keep updates about future um, webinars and registration there. Uh, you can check our website uh, always for future webinars, but um, we'll include a link in the follow-up email to this uh, for be, uh, to, be, to allow you to be able to sign up for our monthly newsletter that will include that information. Um, I do know that a few folks reported that it ended up in their spam box. Um, so check, uh, check your spam um, for a newsletter called the Homeline Connection that you may have received earlier in March, and it might have gone in there. All right, a couple more landlord questions. Um, landlord, uh, and what do I do if I know my tenant lied to receive rent help MN assistance anywhere that I can, is there anywhere I can report this? I'm not actually sure if there is an official place to report that to that takes simply rent help. Did you either of you know of a place that does just that? Yeah, there's a. Go ahead, Rachel. You know, you had it. Uh, it's a fraud. Uh, there's a fraud report fraud link that you can use, whether you're a landlord or a tenant, um, for the rent help specific um, program. And it, I'm sorry, is it exclusive to rent help? It's not just a general sort of that umbrella, the, the welfare fraud concept. It's it's what Rent Help MN has on their website to report fraud. It goes to a place called Ethics Point, which I believe does process more than one category. more than one just okay. rent help fraud complaints. I that's all I know. I don't even I don't know what their timing is, what their requirements are, what information they want out of somebody. I, I I'm not sure. I just know that that's where they're um, if they've got concern if someone has a concern about fraud then that's where they should report it to i threw that link in the chat that's also available straight from rent help amends website um michael a landlord is asking what will happen to pending assistance for residents with respect to rent help applications still in process after may 31st do you want me to take that or do you want to take that mike uh, I, I think that what will happen is, um, well, I don't think that the money necessarily wouldn't be available. I think that the impact on the eviction is all that's really affected uh, by that. So the, 
protection, the only remaining protection we have in place under the rent help phase out off ramp uh, is that a tenant that has a pending application through a place like rent help uh, is protected. A landlord can't initiate or proceed with an eviction um, if there's a pending application, but that expires on, uh, I think it's June 1, it officially expires. Um, but then after that, I think the landlord could still get paid from rent help. It's just that the eviction wouldn't be automatically uh, stopped under the phase out. Um, and as many landlords look at sort of a cost benefit analysis of the eviction process, uh, generally what they want is to get paid. And so hoping to get paid might still be more likely uh, if the landlord does not evict the tenant. So I think there would be sort of self-selecting, I'm not gonna file an eviction thought processes that landlords are gonna have to do at that point. But uh, all that would really change is the protection effectively stopping the landlord from going through with the eviction is lifted. That doesn't mean that the rent helps money or some other program's money would disappear. And that's a, of course, assuming that there's no legislative extension of the phase out, which is, is not inconceivable. Um, I'm not sure that it's likely, but, but nobody ever thinks that anything is likely during the middle of one of these legislative sessions. It's always at the end that decisions like that get made. Thanks, Mike. And that is a good point that there are bills at the legislature to put more money into rent help MN. Um, none of them have, pa have passed yet. Um, and session still goes on for well over a month or more. Um, so uh, I think we've come to a close and we've done some extra credit here, seven minutes uh, of extra credit bonus points. Um, so thank you for joining us. Thank you, Mike and Rachel for fielding these questions and facilitating a great conversation with referee Sadios. I was glad to have her on today to share her expertise. And um, just a reminder, as I mentioned, we can, we'll follow up with uh, an email with a recording, CLE credit information once that happens. And, um, and if you want to sign up for a newsletter for future webinars, uh, that'll be there too. We don't have one set for April yet, but we are planning to organize one that may be focused on that new Brooklyn Center ordinance that the referee talked about today, because that goes into effect on April 9th. And so it'll be impacting a lot of renters and landlords then. So thanks for your time and have a good rest of your Wednesday. Goodbye.